Hi, everybody. It's Kevin Eastman, co-creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We are thrilled, beyond thrilled, actually, to be joining you here today. Um, yes, we're a little frustrated because we can't join you in person, but we know that um, you're being safe, your loved ones are safe, you're doing the right thing, quarantining and making sure that um, the next time we all get together for a big event like WonderCon, that uh, we can enjoy the moment and really share some of these stories live and in person, and that's the most important thing. But um, we need you to be safe first and foremost and most important. Um, we're gonna talk about a really cool project today. It's um, something that um, is probably about 32 years old <laughs> from its original concept. Um, but I've had the uh, incredible good fortune to, um, I wanna say like right on the coattails of my dear friend, Tom Waltz. <laughs> um, Tom Waltz and I spent <laughs> um, the, the better part of the last nine years working on a series that he wrote every single issue, um, all 100 issues of the Turtles. And by the time we got to the end of that, we wanted it to be something special. And we'll get into the ins and outs of what his um, uh, last run is all about. But I want to introduce um, Tom. Tom, say hi to everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Tom <laughs> Walt here. Uh, uh, I guess the writer of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles at IDW Publishing for the last nine years, as Kevin mentioned, and currently collaborator with Kevin and a group of other special people on The Last Ronin. Yes, no, it's fun, you know, it, it's been such an amazing journey and I have to say that um, in so many ways when I was able to join IDW and you and, and, and Bobby and so many fantastic people at IDW, when you started uh, the new series, I remember the days of looking at like, where's this gonna go? How many issues is gonna get out of it? What can this be? But I just loved your original presentation of what you wanted to do as a foundation for a story that sort of led into, well, if we make it for the first 12 issues, then maybe right. we'll get to the second year and so on. Um, but we've been able to, um, uh, with the fan support, um, go the distance and then some. And, uh, you know, man, I think of like, um, every single artist that's come on board to bring those story to life from Dan Duncan originally to, you know, Vanessa, Corey Smith and, um, Michael Delanus uh, to uh, Andy Kuhn to so many other people. So it's been such a insane. I'm going to leave somebody out, but we can't name them all because yeah. they're all fantastic. Um, but it was really such a cathartic, and um, I say cathartic for me because a lot of times when people ask me, like, how do you come up with new stories for the turtles? And well, you know, it's guys like Tom that are uh, people that bring that to light. Um, because I feel like, you know, after we've done so many years and animated shows and the Mars Studios Turtles, but it is the energy and the foundation that Tom originally created with, you know, the reincarnation aspect and so many different elements that were brought in from multiple turtle universes into this universe. They gave us a platform to tell stories where we could not only bring in characters from multiple turtle universes and reinvent them and tweak them a little bit, but also a whole level of uh, original characters. And so right. um, that's, that's, it's been a dream to me. It's been fantastic. Yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things where I always count my blessings, one, just for having the, the gig and being given the gig way back when, but obviously there were many iterations of Turtles that came before our IDW uh, version, so it, it was nice to have so much stuff, that what we always call cherry picking, so I would always cherry pick some, you know, some of the best things, characters, and, and maybe certain themes and ideas from those earlier iterations, and then, you know, have the opportunity to mold them into something new and i think that's probably testament to the power of turtles itself uh because you know all these years later you can still tell fresh stories with these characters um and fans still react old and new fans um luckily for us the critics were pretty friendly to us over the years too so it, it's one of those things where it's it, it's it's kind of like you find that pot of gold and find a way to actually make more gold um, and that's pretty rare, you know, and sometimes things kind of run their course and, and people don't want any more of it. When it comes to turtles, I've learned, um, both just through the work and then interactions with fans at conventions like WonderCon and, and Comic-Con, it's, it's something that continues to give. Um, and like I said, I just count my blessings and, and I, I, and that I was fortunate enough and have been and continue to be part of it. It's uh, it's bigger than any one person at this point. There's no doubt about it. And like you said, there's been so many artists and writers and and creators and video games and movies and TV and everybody who's been involved. And I, what you find is this thing literally has a life of its own. And people come and go, but the turtles itself 
I think is just one of those, like I said, it was lightning in a bottle for you and Peter, and, and that lightning continues to, uh, to, to, I guess, resonate or illuminate or however you describe it. And <laughs> um, it, it's fun. I mean, you know, I'm still having fun. That's probably the other thing I want to say is, and it, it continues to be enjoyable, and Ronan is no exception. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. This is probably one of the most excited I've been about the Turtles in a long time, maybe even since I first started. Well, you know, it's funny. It's like, I always, you know, you brought up a couple of great points and, you know, because I always, you know, um, you know, I do, uh, Courtney and I do you know, probably about 17 shows a year. And so we do these you know, slideshows and presentations and get to meet and greet the fans. Um, but it is interesting that, you know, um, a lot of the fans of varying ages and they seem to, you know, hover around like, you know, 28 to 32 years old is sort of the main original fan base. Um, but they look at um what we've done, what you've done, um, what IDW has done in the IDW Turtle Universe, because it is a very specific own universe, as the definitive Turtle Universe. And I feel the same way in that, you know, again, we were lucky enough to have other universes we could pull from. And I think even your favorite was the 2000 series, wasn't that? Wasn't it the, um... Yeah, you know, I, I actually, the funny thing is I kind of came into this in a weird way because I was in the military, uh, in the Marines during the heyday of the Fred Wolf stuff. So I really wasn't privy to that I didn't have a lot of tv during that time i was out doing marine stuff for most of those years and then uh when i got back you know obviously and, and i was out a few years later the uh, the 2000 i guess it's four kids series came out and that was really my first deep experience with it because my, my daughter was watching it she had them on dvds and i was watching those with her and i, I really liked it um then we you know she was that made her curious about turtles so we had old fred wolf for my son vhs tapes that she started to watch so then i got to see some of those and then and and obviously the mirage comics were always there the now the story of the funny thing is my first experience with turtles i've told this story a couple of times is way back when i was in the marines i had a friend that was a comic book collector one of the guys in the barracks and so that was in this the time when it was uh, a speculators market and everybody was going to be bazillionaires from their comic book collection and so he would every payday with the little money we got in the Marines, he would go buy two comics. So he, he was a big, I think, Marvel guy, and he was buying a lot of comics and storing them in long boxes in the barracks. And one of the other things he would buy are these uh, role-playing game catalogs. And I saw the old resin uh, game, I can't remember who did it uh, for the, the Turtles. And I saw the figures and I saw the name, and I remember, I, I tell this to everybody, the first thing I saw was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I looked at him and I said, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard of in my life. And he said, no, no. He goes, trust me, it's really cool. They're really cool. And I, I just remember thinking, well, the name is Goofy, but the resin characters look pretty neat to me. And then I hadn't, then I didn't think about turtles again for a few years, you know, until after I was Marines and, and had kids and started seeing these things. But yeah, definitely, I always felt like, because, you know, obviously the Mirage comics are the classics and they are the basis for all this. And the one thing I always liked, obviously Fred Wolf was its own thing. And it was it's kind of it's you know a way of bringing in a whole new demographic to the turtles. But I always really liked the 2003 series. I guess it was 2003, and including the the Kevin Monroe um, 2007 CGI movie, which I love a lot. I always felt like that felt the most to me. Like at the very least, it was following the Mirage storyline. You know, there's certain limitations for television, but it had that feeling like if you're going to have Mirage comics, this was about as close as you're going to be able to get and still be able to bring in a young audience. Well, that's great, you know, because it is it's fascinating to me in that, you know, it's it's so true in so many ways that, for example, like, you know, at the height of the black and white comic books, you know, uh, we're talking like 86, 87, um, you know, where I think we're selling 100,000 comic books, which is, with Peter and I, was just phenomenal beyond our wildest dreams. Um, that was just around the time when we were just sort of dipping our toe into all things that um, might be otherworldly turtles like the cartoon show and none of that had come out yet. Um, but it was all about, we had the role playing game, had the little figurines and the turtle universe had been built. And, uh, um, you know, big question mark of where it's gonna go, if it's gonna go anywhere and if we're gonna be, you know, um, looking for other work down the line. <laughs> but what's fantastic about that time period is, um, uh, that was really the basic and the origin of The Last Ronin. Um, and The Last Ronin was um, a story that Peter and I had written because by the time we, you know, like, um, you know, 84, the first issue premiered, by 85, we had you know, four or 
or five issues out, and it just kept increasing. By the time we were getting to 86, 87, we were heading towards um, 10 and 11, plus we had the micro series, which sort of, again, built that foundation of the Trouble Universe. And, um, you know, just to digress for a second, I love that that universe that was built when the height of the sales for those things, it compared, you know, it was like a, you know, um, teacup in the ocean of sort of what became right. of when it became a cartoon series. But we had the people that were first introduced to the Fred Wolf series. Years later, once they grew out of the series, they somehow would discover the black and white series. And then we roped them in for good. They were a part of us. But um, so in 1987, um, you know, I had a couple ideas for where we wanted the turtles to go. And we thought like, sometimes as you do, especially you as a writer, Tom, you know, like sometimes you look at the ending and sort of go like, right. this is where I know I want to end up at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, let's backtrack and see how, how what the path is going to be like uh, to get there. And so we started talking about this final, um, it, it was final slash, could it be a step in the direction towards another turtle universe? Right. Um, but we said, what would ha what would the turtles universe be like in 30 years? So 1987, that would have been 2017, which is funny um, because that was three years ago now. <laughs> um, but that was a story and it was, um, I think in, total makeup was probably about um, 15, 16 pages of material, the stuff that I showed you originally. And I would pull it out occasionally and look at it and go, there's something here. But of course, you know, there was so much going on with the intensity and the epic uh, adventures that were being laid down up to the Turtles issue. So once we knew, and we talked, I think we started talking about it in early 2019, yes. if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And that was at the same time, there's sort of like, we were already sort of looking down the road at this, but it was already like, right. I got to get through issue 100 first. Yeah. <laughs> first. <laughs> Cause you know, the more the issues went on, the page counts got higher and there was so much to deal with, but it was, um, you know, as we sort of um, maneuvered through 2019, getting to issue 100 in uh, December, um, you and I had had a number of conversations about what we wanted right. to last run and based on the original Kevin and Peter idea. And that was, um, that was pretty yeah, exciting. Those conversations, it's funny because, well, the first thing I said when you showed me the outline was that some of the technical stuff that was in there, uh, as far as like what the te future tech would be, which is a, technically mo the modern contemporary technology now. <laughs> um, I was saying Peter there was like Nostradamus when it came to oh, some yeah. of that stuff. I was, it was like blew my mind because you would literally think he had just written that based on stuff he knew, and these were things that didn't even exist or at least weren't weren't. Uh, didn't exist in that format, specifically like the cell phones. And he had ideas about really, literally about the internet and tablets and things like that. And so it was pretty, that, that was pretty amazing to me, but it's funny how you're right. We were, when we first started talking about it, it was exciting, but because of that road to 100, we were on in the main series, we, it was hard to really sit down and, and for me, at least to really grasp it, to really, embrace it the way now I can because I had too many other things going on. It was for me, it was like, I don't, you, you don't want to be shooting for one goal and then seeing that shiny thing over there. It's kind of like that, that pop, popular meme where the guy's walking with his girlfriend, but he's looking back at the other girl, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I was like, I said, don't look back at the other girl right now. You got to worry about issue 100. And uh, so it, it was like, it's almost like a two tiered, um event for me it was you initially showing it to me us kind of talking about it knowing that it was coming and then once once 100 was done and it was really in the hands of the artists and, and our editor bobby and and all those folks i could sit down and look at the story and then it was even like almost like seeing it again for the first time because now i can really kind of get into the weeds get into the details you know and see that the, the forest for the trees and know what what was there and also know what what could work and what might not work now because of things that have happened or stories that have been told in other other turtles media and start really working with you to find find the story it needs to be now but never losing the core elements of that original outline or you know the, the and or the intent of that original outline and that's that's been a fun challenge well it's it's it is and like you know just to not to repeat what you said but only you know in the fact that you know what i love so much about the you know, the 100 issue series, by the time getting to 100, it's like, it's always, a, you know, always imagined, and I described it many times, like, you know, you being in the driver's seat, 
front end of the driver's seat, Bobby being in the passenger seat, you know, helping making sure everything stays on track and organize everything. And I was sort of in the back seat going, yeah, you should do this, you should do this. And what do you think about that? And so we, we had these wonderful mind melts and these creative things, but it was like, there was to me and, and, and you know, to me, it was your show and you were nailing it. So it was, it was as excited as like, again, looking at that shiny thing down the road, it's like, man, you've got 100 issues of stuff to wrap up as well as the introduction of Jenica, which was your creation yep. to so many other parts of that storyline that was had to stay focused, but it was, Interesting in that um, I think we both arrived at a point. Um, because of course, you finished the writing on um, issue 100 uh, about a month or two before um, it came out because the artist had to do the work. But that's when we started zeroing in on issue on the last Ronin concept because right. it was like, well, um, where do we go from here? Because man, Tom, you wrote 100 issues and it's fantastic, right. and we worked with this incredible art team and IDW. It was just this. Well, you know, it's the definitive, in my opinion, the definitive turtle series. And so I think we both look back to one of our favorite, um, you know, all time comics, which is, of course, uh, Frank Miller's Dark Knight. And, and I think we fell in love with this idea that based on this story that was conceived, you know, 32 years ago, is that could we take and we adapt that appropriately and put it into a, a context, say, 20 years from now, and then make it our dark night in the sense that um, you know, it's not a specific turtle universe per se, but it definitely leans more towards a Mirage universe. But there's, there's a lot of elements that we added to and sort of built on to that original concept. And I think we both had to keep reminding ourselves to sort of like, because with so quickly after spending nine years and you especially spending nine years um, on the regular ongoing series, it was like, you almost had to keep going, well, we did that in issue 68, but wait, yeah. that's a different universe. <laughs> so you had to adjust. Yeah. Um, but you know what's fun is a lot of these, um, we have some great questions from some fans, and a lot of them are going to, you know, if you get too far ahead on mm. us going, because I know, like, um, what was the last Mind Melt phone call we had? It was only five hours, right? Five hours um, long, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, wife, my wife said, you never even talked to me that long. We were dating ever. <laughs> <laughs> this is important. This is bro stuff. This is turtle stuff. Yeah, uh, um, but if you, I know we've got a list of questions from some fans, and I think we're going to get into some of the stuff we talked to, right. uh, talk about last round. So you want to, you want to read some of the questions? Yeah. And we'll... All right. Let me see here. So I got a first question here. Um, <laughs> this is a good one. Can you give us a quick plot overview for the last Ronin? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. There's no, <laughs> no. The funny thing is, it would have to be quick without giving spoilers. So I'll get, I'll give my version first. So because you, I wanted to follow up on something you just said. The one thing I think that's always worked for you and me as a team is you and I are both in the tank for Frank Miller, especially the Frank Miller stuff from from the Dark Knight Returns era and and the Daredevil stuff that he did back then, Electra. And so my initial excitement about this beyond the story itself and the outline that I saw was that this idea you came to me and said, Hey, I got this thing that it's going of can be our dark night. And it was kind of like, you had me at that moment. You had me <laughs> at dark night and Frank Miller. So I'll let you, you describe the plot, but for me, what this is, is kind of like, it is kind of our dark night or maybe our old man Logan, but that's not saying enough, but to say more would be saying probably too much at this point. So I'll leave it at that. But this is, this is a new turtle story, and it's not. I guess that's one way to, just, to describe it. But uh, I'll let you take take it from there. No, it's a, well, you know, the, the, in a nutshell, you're right because it is like, um, you know, we've been um, so lucky over the years with different uh, creators that have brought a different vision to the different turtle universes, and you know, uh, my love and has been the same as your well, the IDW turtle universe. And so with this one, we felt like. You know, there's uh, enough room in here that we can, again, this is probably the biggest part of modeling after Dark Knight, if you will, is that, because um, even though all the characters within that Dark Knight story structure, all characters we were familiar with, we knew their origins, we knew a lot about them. And so Dark Knight assumed that you knew about the Batman universe. So he was right. able to sort of take steps and, and tell a story that was, um, fresh and edgy and invigorating and, and just tweaking a nudge in this way and that, but it was sort of set within its own universe. It didn't follow any kind of continuity, um, past, present, or future, I guess. Um, and so I think that's what appealed. And we felt like um, 
know, after going through um, epic uh, journey that the IDW Turtle Universe had gone through and what that saw, this was sort of like, okay, whew, okay, let's now take it to the next level and let's write something that is um, even more perhaps intended for an older audience. Again, we, I feel like um, throughout the whole IDW Turtle Universe journey, it was always written story first and story for ourselves, if you will. Right. I think you were writing those stories for yourself, um, most of all, um, mm -hmm. but I think that this one was, all right, let's sort of dismiss a lot of the stuff, let's um, sort of narrow down into, in, in respect to right. you know the awesome Peter Laird and what had been done at that time, because it is true, you touched on it, and not to digress, but some of the drawings, and I'm sure they'll be in the collectors or something, when you see some of the stuff that he was drawing of what stuff would be like in the future in 1987, right. you'd go like, um, but that was sort of it was being respectful to that idea, but also telling a, a really exciting tale um, that comes down to story for us and story for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's edgy, it's different, but anybody that's ever done the turtles and done the turtles well, like IDW, always falls on the same basic, most important principles. And Tom, you can describe them most of all. It's family, and it's, family. but um, that's that's what works. So we needed to have that heart and soul story or it wouldn't work right and, and and it's funny because you know people will with turtles having existed as long as it has obviously many stories have been told in many different iterations so what that does is it automatically and, and, and naturally will uh, you know elicit comparisons and so one of the things um we talked about the four kids story the four kids mm -hmm. version and they had a great episode i think it was called same as it never was where where donatello goes into the future and it's pretty dystopian and dark and so there's there's naturally going to be comparisons. It's not that, but but it is in the sense that that's a wonderful turtle story, and this kind of has some of those same elements. But this will be a new, you know, future story. And again, like one of those things where it's it's in its own timeline or it's not really in a timeline per se, kind of like Dark Knight. However, like with Dark Knight, once Dark Knight was out. Then all of a sudden you have Dark Knight Strikes again, and now we have other stories that they've told in that universe. It's kind of become its own universe in a way. And as I said, from that moment you showed me the outline to even now when I'm working on outlines for the series, it's it's evolving in and of its own. It's just, it just it can't help but be kind of coming kind of its own thing. And I'm excited because I always feel like we're going to tell a story that can be a standalone and this could be the turtle story that if you never read another tur turtle story, you can read this and be okay with it. But I still feel like these damn turtles, they don't want to give up there. And they're saying, <laughs> we want more stories in this universe now. So I'm already like trying not to look at that shiny thing again. <laughs> down the line, So we get through last Ronin, but I'm, but it, but it's exciting for that because you would think, like I said, you've been doing this, you know, decades. I did it for a decade. We should be bored. And it never gets boring. If, if anything, never. I'm always, I'm always happily surprised when I wake up and go, I'm just as excited, if not more so today, to be working with these characters than I was when I started and prayed that I had four issues in me before you know it got canceled. You know, and a hundred issues later, multiple annuals, free comic. I mean, video games. I've done a lot of stuff with turtles, and I've been fortunate, but I, I just don't feel like I'm ready to stop it. And Ronan is just like you said, the next. I think logical step for us as a team to with turtles we you know the the main book is sophie's now sophie campbell is doing a great job and i want i'm excited because she's putting she's putting her her voice into the the characters and and if this is her story now uh, in the main book we told our 100 issue story and now this is the next story i think we're meant to tell with with these characters well you know and what what's been so exciting for me because it really was um as i mentioned earlier it's like when I joined IDW in, in um, 2011 when you guys were launching this. It really was, like I said, it was you're driving and Bobby's in the passenger seat and um, I'm in the back seat. But it's like we, we had such a wonderful creative system of mind melts as well as, you know, other artists, um, uh, other writers and stuff that uh, Paul and, um, and uh, oh, uh, what's the name? But people that have brought other things into the Turtle universe has been so fantastic. But what's been interesting in this one is that it is, um, you know, we're both sort of in this in the front seat together in the sense that we right. sort of have an idea. We're sort of always thinking about, say, Peter and sort of what that part of the component is, as well as you know, being respectful to that, as well as so we're actually working in a very different style because you would normally, 
you know, write a, a, a treatment and outline and, and you know, mm. all these assistants, and then it would be approved, and then we'd sort of, you'd go into full mm. writing full scripts, and then that would be what right. pass on to the artist. But in this one, it's like we decided from the word go that we wanted to have a bit more of um, ebb and flow to that same right. system. There are chunks of the story that you're writing in full script, based on the stuff that we're talking about, but there's other stuff that we, we talked about. Like my my want list was the action scenes, which I know you right. love as much as I do and that kind of stuff. And so we were sort of like, well, we'll do this, this, and this up to this page. And then I'll, I'll sort of, we'll do a you know, quote unquote Marvel style or sort of lay out and sort of piece this sequence together and sequence would sort of keep bouncing that stuff back and forth. And it would evolve right. into this, you know, kind of weirdly cool mind melt, which I think is gonna give it, um, completely different energy not in a in, in, in no disrespect to anything that's come before but this is just a new energy for both of us and that's what's been really exciting to me yeah. that it's been uh, uh, yeah and it, it's and like you said maybe that's part of the what's ma making this even more fun is this is a new way of writing for us a new way of yes. collaborating because you're right i mean bobby was so involved our editor bobby kerno was so involved before because he was helping us co-plot the stories and so there was a lot of front end as far as us having the mind melds Bobby kind of, poor Bobby, the captain of that ship, and he still is, trying to find a way to, to keep us all reined in and keep it organized, and then me taking that that information that 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 he tabulated, putting into script format, giving it, you know, with, you know, specific instructions to these artists what we wanted. And now this is more of a, like you said, ebb and flow kind of organic process, which is fun and kind of terrifying at the same time because... <laughs> That's what keeps it all going. Yeah, right. but 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 it, but I I like it and it, it's I think that then creates fresh storytelling opportunities because yeah. because you can fall into kind of a I think a routine and a pattern and in this case we're breaking that pattern and it's 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 been a lot of fun because you might not necessarily know what's coming from me we know in general what we want we know what the story's supposed to be we have milestones throughout the issues that we need to reach and touch but the story is coming together really in some ways on the fly big parts of it and that's been like i said both terrifying and, and exciting but again it's it, it's these turtles kind of forcing themselves in, into your psyche and your heart saying we have more stories that need to be told about us and here now so run do it and and yeah well that was you know and you're right it's like you know because that's what i did i love about it and um and we should get back to more questions because otherwise people are going to start falling asleep <laughs> You know, would be no, no. I'm kidding, of course. But no, that was the exciting part of like, um, you know, even the last because we've had multiple mind melts and, and all those times that we get to it face to face. But now it's, we're just talking on the phone or skyping and and things. But just the last um, five hour session was like stuff that sort of evolved out of issue one. We've got you know, we've got the beat out lines for all five issues, and I think that was one of the questions. Um, but it's like, uh, but stuff that evolved out of what we discovered in parts of. You know, the first issue, and as you, you know, did the final breakdown of issue two, we're kind of going like, okay, now we have to adjust, but that's yeah. what's exciting. So it does it sort of keep it fresh and keep it exciting because it is really, uh, you know, it's always it's always story for us. Right. Well, and, and for a specific example, real quick, would be, you know, we've turned in, we we sat down and we worked out issue two, and and I broke down the issue and and kind of chunked it out for how we wanted to, to flow. We've passed that to Bobby and Nickelodeon for their review. And as I'm working on issues three through five, I realized probably I'm gonna have to change a few things in two because <laughs> now that I'm working on three, I realize this information should come out here, you know, in the storyline. So, I mean, minor changes here and there, but that's just, it's just part of the organic, uh, I think, nature of the storytelling. All right, that's okay, what makes it here, here's a question for you that you can answer okay. quick. So the next question is, and this is a good question, what is the series format and how many issues? Well, that was um, that was an important thing because one of the things that we explored early on when we talked about it is like um, IDW did a, a wonderful um, representation of the first uh, four issues plus Raphael um, in the original size format, which is um, larger in size and all that. Right. So we talked about doing not only in all those early issues that Peter and I did were always um, between thirty-seven and forty pages. Issue one was forty pages, so we. We said, well, let's do larger size stories. And I think originally we said, well, maybe 48 pages. Right. We sort of brought it down to 40 pages per issue. We talked about doing larger in format, which I believe has been lit. Um, and then we said, immediately we were like, well, let's do a four issue miniseries. And I think you came back right away and go like, how about five? Yeah. <laughs> because it was a lot of story to fit in. So it's going to be, um, 
And now I, I want seven. six. <laughs> <laughs> you know, by the time we, oh, and I don't get, get that. <laughs> I don't get Bobby more gray hair. No, no. Uh, by the time we get to issue four, I would say, hey, can we do six? But no, right now it's um, uh, five issues, forty pages of story in each issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of be. Mm -hmm. And then the next question is: here's, This is an easy one too. Who is doing the pencils and the inking? Yeah, no, that's um, it was one of those things that um, I've been uh. We've all been a long time fan and friend of, of Andy Foon. And um, uh, he's done many, many of the uh, uh, iconic turtle stories um, over the turtle universe um, yep. since 2011. So we felt like you and I discussed and we felt like he had a bit of gravitas and a, and a bit of edge and a sort of stylistically what we wanted to, to help bring the story to light. So we discussed that you and I, again, it would be sort of a, Breaking down the stories in semi script script form, then I would do um, some, some detailed layouts mm -hmm. of how the pacing goes, and then from those layouts would would, would have Andy do the finishes on those. So um, right now that seems to be um, uh, Andy Kuhn is the guy that's going to knock it out of the park for us. We're so excited that he's going to be penciling. Yeah, yeah, and it's I remember it was interesting to work with Andy now because. Andy was at, you know, Dan Duncan did the first 12 issues of The Ongoing, and I believe Andy was the first new artist we brought in when, when Dan stepped away from the series. So, you know, my, my uh, relationship with Dan, Andy on Turtles goes pretty far back, all the way back to issue 13. So uh, it's fun to be working with him again. And, uh, and plus, he's a, he's a rock and roll guy, so that, that works for me. <laughs> well, so, you know, if anybody's seen his, um, the teaser that's been rolled out, I know that um, we're we're sneaking and leaking, you know, whether it be the covers and, yeah. and you put out a really wonderful presentation of, uh, it was like a sneak peek at um, the first couple of pages and stuff. So you can see sort of um, what uh, what Andy's been doing. And we have, uh, um, getting to work with an awesome colorist. Um, I've never worked with uh, Brittany and please don't let me butcher her name. It's Pazello, I think. I think, yeah. Z-Z-I-L-I-O, um, who's not only a frontline nurse, but she's also doing coloring for us bless her buttons uh, in every sense of the word and she's yeah. awesome and so she's bringing a great visual sense to it so we're oh yeah a nice yeah. team so we're pretty excited and i think that's going to be a big obviously you know the artwork is important but I, I do feel um and i've always felt this way about any comics i've worked on as a writer or an editor that it, it, it's made or broken with the color and uh, well, well the colors and the lettering i think i think the the unsung heroes of comic books are the colorists and the letterers um and some superstar ronda pattis on the main book for all those issues and uh, uh, in our letterer at idw sean lee who's taking care of us on that side and he has to put up with me because you, you know me until the very last second we send it to the printer i'm i'm making changes and making <laughs> make changes. but um but the uh, the colors coming from Brittany have been awesome. I mean, there you can see them on that virtual background behind you, and it's just it, it's really I think even more important in, the, in this series to set that mood with with a certain color scheme and palette. Yeah. So uh, next question for you. This is, this might be a tough one. What is unique about the last Ronin? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That's um. You know, this we I think we we definitely um dipped our toe into that pool before because it is, um, you know, to, as a quick sum up, it's sort of a, a, an individual turtle universe within itself, um, but it's still related to all turtle universes mm. within itself. It is um, a story told 20 years in the future. There's um, a lot of things that um, don't relate to any other series that's been done before, not only the IDW universe, but other ones, um, but it's also familiar in that there have been, I guess, a, um, futuristic turtle stories that have been told. I mean, Cyril Neely did a wonderful couple part episode mm. at the end of the 2017 series and that kind of stuff. But this is, um, it's kind of our take on one possible future in, in, in a way that um, keeps all the heart and soul of the family, mm. keeps, um, answers some questions that even, I think maybe both you and I had over the series and series right. over the years. So it's, it's, just, it's unique to within itself. And I think that it's, um, it's got to kind of jump in the back seat, buckle up, and hold on because yeah, I think you got to be pretty pleased with what you're going to see in the next uh, um, the the next, two, next 200 pages. 
<laughs> I know. <laughs> Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> so here's um here's one. We kind of answered this already. So it says, um, on what timeline is the last Ronin going to take place? And when and where does the last Ronin story begin? Well, that's you know again to again not to repeat and, and but it is um it was one of those things that um I think we had to look down the road at um um you know and you and I talked about it early on because sort of when you set a story in the future and this is I think the first thing that we address is like well how many years in the future and you know when you look at the timeline of technology we had in the 60s to what we have now to what we would need to be and you know, how fast that's progressed. We wanted to, you know, really think about the world condition, right? Not make it a centerpiece of the story. It was sort of like mm -hmm. it was things we allude to of things that might have happened, you know, things that have happened in the in the world on planet Earth. But we wanted to keep right. it again centered to um, the main story characters, our our version of um, Manhattan. And yeah. There. And so it's sort of it's a bit in the future, not you know, it's I guess twenty years in the future. I think we kind of, it's funny because there's, there's Blade Runner-esque, you know, elements to the story. And I think it's kind of a similar challenge. So, so if, you know, in 1980 or 1981, whenever Ridley Scott made Blade Runner, which is another reason I was drawn to this because Blade Runner is probably one of the things, The Hobbit was one and Blade Runner was another things that have changed my life and changed, yeah. you know, the direction of, of, you know, I guess my creative pursuits or, or the things that really appealed to me and the things I went after. Um, you know, obviously in the 80s, 2019 seemed far away, and that's where Blade <laughs> Runner takes place. Suddenly you're at 2019, and we don't have spinners flying around, and we don't have these things happening. And, you know, some of it did, some of it didn't. So that seems all of a sudden, it could seem dated in 2019, but because it's not really about that stuff, it's about people and humanity and playing God and things that, whether there's new technology or old technology, those are things people relate to and, and, and connect to. The story still works. And then you bring in Dennis Villeneuve, who makes his challenges. Okay, I'm going to make a sequel to that. How do I make it work when we know these things didn't actually happen in 2019? And then he makes this wonderful Blade Runner 2049. And you realize it doesn't matter. All that stuff's part of the setting. And, and it's something I've always preached with superhero comics and with the turtles. When people ask me what what is the most important thing to me, it's not – and. It, you would think, oh, it's a comic book, so it's the swords and the fighting and all that stuff. And to me, it's something I learned from a guy who I worked with early on, a guy named Frank Fardello. When I first started writing superhero stories, he he was the editor in chief, and he told me, look, quit. The, my stories were getting rejected early on, and it wasn't because they were bad stories per se. I, I suppose these were prose stories, but it was. He kept saying, don't worry about the powers. That's just part of the setting. You're you're focusing on that. Make me care about the characters, and then. The, the powers and, and all that stuff in the fights, those are just the cherry on top. And I always tell myself that when I'm writing these stories, that ultimately this turtle story, for example, you know, The Last Ronin, this is a dystopian future. Those stories have been done before with the turtles and obviously with Wolverine and, and other characters. But what matters in the end is, can, can the reader relate to what's happening? Whether it is a sunny future or a gritty future, or it doesn't matter. What is important is, can they walk away from this and say, this story moved me at a human level, and added bonus, there was some really cool fight scene. You know what I mean? And, so, <laughs> and, and I think that's how, how, why turtles work so well, because I always tell people, I'm never going to get in a fight, most likely, well, I don't know, with Corona, maybe, but I'm never going to get in a fight in some alley with swords with ninja. Yeah. But I have siblings and I have family that, that you know, there's, there's always continuing drama in the family that is the same for the turtles. And in yeah. the last Ronin, it's no different. This is a story. I mean, in, a, in many ways, that is the story. This is a story about family, just probably in the way we haven't seen it with the turtles at, up to this point. No, you're right. And no, it, it, it's, it's, it's story for us, family first. Um, but there's also, it's like, what I like is that some of the stuff that, um, Again, it's it's so hard because you know we're we're this far down the road and we don't want to give too much away. But yeah. it's like there is stuff that um, has been part of the universe of turtles, story elements and ideas and themes that have been set in place that you know haven't been fully addressed. But right. I think they, it gave us we, we picked some of the 
big ones that we want to make sure are an important part of the story, but it does come down to uh, the story and family. So it's, right. um, and so, and there's a lot of fighting, like a lot of fighting. Yes, yes, <laughs> very much. But, but I guess in some ways, there's going to be elements of fighting in this story that would be new and unique to the Turtles. Yes. And I think that'll, that'll be a, a cool part of it for a lot of fans. Uh, here's the next question. What made you guys decide to do this story now, 30 years after the original idea? Well, I think that, you know, again, we touched on it um, a little bit and just that it was, um, you know, um, as, you know, as one of the co-creators of the Turtles and watching what um, Tom and what IDW uh, didn't accomplish with the, the 100 issues and seeing where it went. And it, it just felt like, um, and I think even Tom, you can address it, but it felt like by the time you get to issue 100, you'd really sort of wrapped it up with a little bow on top, mm -hmm. so to speak. You weren't done with it, but you sort of said, this journey that I've been on for this right. all these years, or at this point, and then that was, I think, the excitement where I said, well, okay, take 25 deep breaths um, and mm -hmm. you know, bring in another, you know, say Sophie and some of the other amazing mm -hmm. writers that we worked with, because by then we had already sort of eyeing that shiny thing and like, well, here's a way we can step away from because i think that was part of the um intensity of getting to say issue 90 through 100 because right trying to wrap up and you're you know you're trying to wrap up you know how many characters how many story elements and and, and make it all work yeah. and fit and i think you know i think it gave bobby nightmares and all of you know just sort of like make sure we everything lined up so this was a way to sort of step away but then go i still love turtles and this is the story that i right. want to sink my teeth into and not this mm. journey because it, it sort of sets aside a bunch of those things you don't have to worry about certain story elements that need to be addressed in some way or, or fashion to make sure the story stays true and, and, and linear um, yeah and, and like, you said, like you said i think i think the generic aspect of it i guess is i don't know if that's the right term but that the fact that we're trying to tell the story that kind of stands alone as a turtle story and i mean it, we, I mean, right up front, full disclosure, I have a lot of fans already asking me online and stuff, is this, does this point to IDW? Does this point to Mirage? What is this, what timeline does this point to? And I just, my answer is yes. There's no, it doesn't, <laughs> I mean, I can't, there, it, if you think it's only pointing to Mirage, then you'll be disappointed. If you think it only points to Fred Wolf, you'll be disappointed and IDW. This is its, its own thing, which I think makes it special, but it's also, it's also like Dark Knight, this story we can tell, you know, after all, after like I said, the question asked 30 years later, there's enough Turtles history, we can tell this story. And even if you just kind of have a generic understanding of Turtles, you'll be able to read this and enjoy it, hopefully. You know, and there's not going to, you won't need to know what happened in 100 issues of IDW comics or in years and decades worth of Mirage comics or all the TV shows. It, it, you just need to know who the turtles are and some basic elements. It's like knowing that Bruce Wayne's parents got killed and in front of him, and that's what's driven his his him to fight crime the way he has since he was a kid. That's enough information to enjoy Batman. You know what I mean? Um, where whereas with the turtles, you know these these are four brothers. Their father's a rat. They were mutated and at, they've been fighting to survive ever since you know against harsh elements both both known enemies and unknown and, and i think that's that's the key here is as long as you know that, that that's why i think i like that cgi movie so much in 2007 my favorite part about that was the opener you didn't you there was no origin in that movie you never saw them get mutated all you knew was there was a quick i think it was Lawrence fishburne too who did the voiceover i'm pretty sure um they did they did this thing where he just gave a a quick description, a narrative description of the turtles, and then go. And it was enough. It was enough. Anybody, anybody who, <laughs> forgive the pun, but you must be living under a shell if you don't know about the turtles at this point. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so it's 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 enough. You know. And I think that's that's the best way to describe the timeline is this points back to thirty years of turtles, thirty five years of turtles, and no, that's like, you know, that's enough. No, no, I love that because it's like that's we we there was a point we addressed very early on. It's like we don't want to retell the origin. We want to do this. It's right. sort of like we'll you'll have it's like if you never read a turtle comic or like mm -hmm. you said you were living on a shell on a rock, it's like you would still read it and get mm -hmm. everything you needed to out of it as a story concept as a whole. But we wanted to leave us out to address other right 
one. So, uh, uh, but well put, that was, I will say, I love the 2007 movie because that was my second favorite Casey Jones besides Elias Cateus in the first yeah. movie. Chris Evans, before he was Captain America, yeah. he was Casey, Casey Jones, Jones. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and that, like I said, I, I think that's, that's kind of one of those uh, under, for some people, underappreciated gems in the turtle history. I think, I think if people sat down and really watched that movie again, um, it's fantastic. I think, I think they would probably love it even more. I love it. I've, I've seen it many times. And I mean, it, that came out and, I think around the same time Turtles Forever with when with and that was all the timeline crossing there. I thought that was that was fantastic too. But very clever. All right, so I got we got a I'm just like got 15 minutes. So here I'll start reading some more questions. Next question <laughs> is We talk too much. Last, yeah. <laughs> what what made Last Ronin return? I can answer that one easy. I I'll just say unfinished business and on different levels, but goes back to family and so i think uh i think that's probably enough and then but i think what is nice about this is the ronin who returns is believing one thing and over the course of the story we'll find out that it was something entirely other than what the mission started out as original yeah well put very well put uh will we see uh this is a good one will we see any utrams Triceratons or Federats? Um, no. <laughs> no, too. No, and well, you... well no. Uh, who? Um, <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I think. I think. Um, we're, we're not getting really good that, at our poker face. That's one of those things again from Turtle history and multiple iterations that we aren't ignoring. It no. may not necessarily be the most important part of the story, but it certainly exists in this timeline. Yeah. Some of that does. Um, I guess we can leave it at that. Well, actually, you know, and actually one of the, I was uh, doing an interview recently, and one of the fans asked if Jenica was going to be part of this. And again, it sort of definitely goes back to the concept of all these things where this mm -hmm. is, again, it's a unique universe within itself. So it's sort of, um, you won't see Jenica. We can say that safely. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Not giving any spoilers, um, but it's um, it's a you know sort of again we we want to set up a very unique specific turtle universe, and I'll just leave it at that because right. I'm starting to repeat and, now. And, and but it's funny. <laughs> I don't want to give anything it's, away. It's, it's probably worth mentioning with Jenica because Jenica comes up a lot, which makes me happy. Yeah. You know, that we was part of what of what we wanted to you know we wanted that character and we wanted to to bring her into the to the ongoing to, when we were coming up to 100. I think it's important to say it's not because we don't love Jenica. I do, obviously. I know you do. Oh, yeah. I said it's probably more because Jenica's it's Jenica's chance to shine right now in that series, and I think yes. I think that's more important for that character. Um, I mean, story aside, and the fact that this was you know thirty years ago there was no Jenica, so she wouldn't have been in the outline. But we don't need Jenica in this story to make it work. But I do feel like the ongoing at this point is better for having Jenica. And I think, oh my I, goodness. think uh, I think that's where she needs to be right now. And, and you've got Sophie doing great things with her, Brom Rebel, and, and and Bobby's got big plans. And, and it's it's one of those things where I think she just needs the opportunity to grow as a character over there before we bring her into anything like this. 100%. Hmm. All right, so let's see. Here's one. Uh, are there any samurai comics, movies, or et cetera, that directly inspired The Last Roman? I would say roughly um, all of them. Yes. <laughs> I, I, if I had to specifically call things out for me as I'm writing, I, and we've mentioned a few Dark Knight, obviously, Blade Runner, um, yeah. both Blade Runner Dragon. movies. Um, I'm a huge, I love Tom Cruise's Last Samurai. I think that's, I love that movie. Yes. So there's elements of that, at least, you know, thematically or as far as the mood is concerned. Um, gosh, yeah, everything, the raid. And, and, well, yeah, End of the Dragon, of course, which is, which is a big yep, part of it, our Dragon. original Bruce Lee movie. But I was like, literally, it's like I, you know, besides uh, um, being a, a martial arts movie junkie for so many years, one of my favorite all-time uh, martial arts movies, and Tom's heard me mention it a billion, trillion different times, is, um, is a um, Jet Li movie <laughs> that is um, just um, the best. It's sort of Jet Li's, uh, I don't know, uh, Fist of, um, God, I just wonder how it is. Um, Fist of Legend, sorry. Of Legend. So I, always, I immediately want to say Bruce Lee's Fist of Fury, but it's yeah. Fist of Legend, and it was, um, to my 
my feeling was uh, Jet Li's love poem to Bruce Lee's Fist of Fury and all things Bruce Lee because it's just a wonderful thing. And so those are the kinds of fight scenes that I'm looking at when I'm laying out some of those fight scenes in the book. I'm trying to capture that Ellen essence and intensity when we do some of the fight stuff in this series, which is going to be right. I think I think the Hugh Jackman, the last Wolverine one, was it Logan? I think there's there's I see element to that in here. Um, but a lot, you know, like you said, I think moment to moment our inspiration changes. So there's there's so many things. And so like I said, this is just um, hopefully a new way of telling an old story. And I, I think any new story is probably a new way of telling an old story. It, there's nothing new under the sun, so they say. Um, but there's always, I think, new ways to express those those themes and that's what this is here. So we're we're drawing from a lot. I uh, I think even from our own work, you know, things like you said that maybe we did it a certain way that we could have done it differently or this timeline gives us an opportunity to sell, tell something a little differently than we did before. Okay. Certainly in a more mature manner because I mean our our ongoing series was always I think teen plus but that was by design because we we wanted to bring in a, a bigger audience. Um, and this this comic gives us a chance to tell maybe a little more mature story that I think is still accessible to a, a broad demographic, but it's it is a, a little more, I guess, for lack of a better term, grown up maybe than other turtle versions. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's All right, next question. Uh, <laughs> here's one. You get this. You've never been asked this before, I bet. Who's your favorite Ninja Turtle? Well, my joking answer obviously is uh, Rapatello or Donanato or uh, <laughs> or I'll say April or something. Um, but I, cause I know who, well, I know your favorite turtle. But it, it, to me, it was always very true. Um, and an answer where you know, to Peter and I, the turtles were always our kids, um, and so we loved them all equally. And uh, you know, and it became you know three men and their babies, so to speak. When Tom, you know, officially became. Uh, one of the fathers, it was sort of, we still love them all, but we still had our favorites. And to me, I would always say, right. they go, well, if you had to choose one, who would it be? And I would always choose, you know, Michelangelo because he was you know, sort of the first turtle drawn. Yeah. And I said, only because firstborn, but I do love them dearly. And, and uh, you know, Pete's has always been Donatello. And what is yours? Is You know, I always like Leo because I like the sword. And, and the idea of Leo kind of like Captain America where he's probably would be the hardest one to be because he has to lead and that's not an easy position to be in. Um, but I, it's funny, uh, probably I most like Michael, Michelangelo, yeah. my personality. Um, but I have starting to look more like splinter. So I've said, over <laughs> the years, <laughs> I've become a dad and a, and a bit more mature myself. So, uh, the funny thing is over the, over the course of writing the turtles this, this last decade, I've, probably related the most to Splinter and then ultimately if, if anybody read you know issue one through 100 what I realized at the end or for the end was like I'm telling Splinter's story I didn't yes, realize yeah. that until it got close to the end I go I never maybe subconsciously I always knew that but he's certainly the one I most relate to but I, I think uh, I always liked katana swords since I was a kid so that was what really was my appeal with Leo and then uh but over you're right over time you you can't pick a favorite. Probably the hardest one to write is Donatello because I'm not that smart. Just an old dumb marine. So uh, Don Donatello requires more Google time than any uh, anybody else. <laughs> God bless Google. And, you know all those uh, awesome. Uh, I rely on some of the some of the TMNT super fans because they sort of they they they're not afraid to correct us when we think, you know or offer suggestions when we think. We oh no, not at all, not at all. And and the, I guess talking about the fans, it's interesting you bring that up in the years of, of signing and, and being at panels, there is no clear cut favorite turtle. Fans across, I, I would say it, it's like 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. The, the four Ooh. turtles have equal love from fans. You, know, you never hear one name over, you hear all the different turtles for different reasons. And I think that's part of the, again, without a doubt, part of the draw for this property, this brand. No, that is, and that's, you're right, because that's one of my favorite things. I always ask fans and I'm, do as well at conventions you say who's your favorite turtle and why mm. because you can tell a lot about um, a person's personality who you've never met in a line of people coming to get to hang and visit with you and uh um, right. you tell it's like if they've gravitated to i like donatella because of this because i'm kind of like that or i'm the funny one or on this it's, 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 all right so we've got so we got four minutes so let me four see. minutes ah, we're having too much fun let's go another is hour it, what do you say 
It says, is it difficult to find unexplored story elements or ideas for a franchise in comics that have been running for so many years? I think we kind of already answered that. Not, it, it really isn't. No, it isn't. And it's like, and that's your fault, Tom Waltz and, <laughs> and uh, Paul and uh, so, I mean, so many other people that bring these ideas to play. And even like, you know, when uh, you do think like as I was, you know, Peter and I were intimately involved in say, the original 300 cartoon shows and, you know, the movies. And then um, I did the, the much beloved um, Next Mutation series, the live action one. Ha ha ha. Peter did the 2000 series. But it was always um, the creative people that you get to in engage with that, um, this particular version or the here and now is that um, so many of the fans were um, original fans like Cyril Neely, yourself and people that bring in a unique vision and a fresh vision, which then is are inspiring. And then, you know, I get to work with all these um, turtle artists that draw better than I do already. <laughs> already. But no, it's, it's, it's infectious. And I love that it's, um, it, it opens it up to a level that um, just makes me as, giddy and enthusiastic and enjoying myself as much as I did back in those days, you know. Right. Never taken away from Peter and I, of course, but back to those days where it's all about the love of comics and telling a story that it brings me back to that moment. Which is, the most which is a good segue. The last question is, what are you most excited about for the future of Turtles comics? Well, man, it's, um, and I'm going to try to say this carefully because I know we're all in the same boat. It's like, I can't wait to for all of us to go back to our favorite comic store to smell the smell of our favorite yes. comic store, which is a beautiful thing to behold. I can't wait till we go back to conventions. I can't wait till we get to interact mm -hmm. like we used to. But I know that um, um, we're all in the same boat. We all miss those times and those moments and those things, but they will come back. We're getting yes. through it. It's a tough fight. But you know what? Um, Tom and I get to come and hang out with you here and now and today. And this is still, you know, we're not there in person, but it's like, uh, we get to share the love and respect and thank you for your support. And um, we can't wait for you to read Last Ronin. We, we, we're we so excited. I just, you know. Yes. It's like, you know it's and like, I think, I think too, like, we've got Ronin, obviously. The stuff Sophie and them are doing over on the main, series, the main right. book is exciting. And then we've actually got a, a story coming up, an annual that I've written Ronin. that, that kind of ties back. It's kind of a, kind of like a little capstone to our, uh, issue 100, some of the things that, because Sophie picked up the story six months later, which was something we all agreed was the best way to go. And then we talked about doing the annual, which will come out hopefully in the next few months, which kind of fills in some of the gaps there uh, between 100 and where Sophie picked up in issue 101. And, um, but I also feel like sets sets the, the groundwork for some more exciting stories for her to tell and other writers. And uh, um, I think, you know, the, the, the Turtles, Comics feature is still rosy, despite whatever is going on in the world at the time. Um, oh, yes. People still want turtle stories, and we'll continue to do our best to keep telling, hopefully, stories that you want to read. Um, and I think, well, you know, it's uh, like, because that's the thing is, I always steal and I always grab that moment. It's like, and I was like, you know, the reason that Tom and I have jobs and all of <laughs> us have jobs is because we have the best fans in the world. Yes. And, um, you know, speaking directly to our fans, and again, it's like, you know, we also like you want to be in our favorite comic store so you know i know there's um a lot of social distancing and there's things they're trying to reopen our business and i'm going to do it carefully and safely but always reach out support your local comic book store as best you can under these times and circumstances um you know there's lots of social media stuff like this kind of stuff we're doing that you can still enjoy moments in comic history and um digital stuff but i think you know look to idw uh, for the latest and the greatest in the uh, most um, important updates of when we can get back out there and what you're going to see. KevinEastmanStudios.com is my own website, which will sort of marry up to part of that. But, uh, um, you know, we're strong. We're going to get past this. I'm going to get back to a life um, that we loved. Uh, it's going to be different, but it's going to be as precious and as important. But, um, yes, you know, all I can say right now is we're at home, being safe, and having a blast. Right. We're working, we're working on the last road in. Yeah. That's right. It's like and even with social distancing, the one nice thing is with or without social distancing, there's always social media. So yeah. definitely, you know, check out Kevin's website. We both have, you know, our Twitter accounts, Facebook. Uh, IDW has active and robust Twitter and Facebook accounts. Also, IDWpublishing.com. So we've kind of, you know, opened um, the, the bag a little bit and let something out, which was the, the preview of Last Ronin recently. Um, look for more, I think, 
teases and sneak peeks and uh, things of, of that nature as we progress toward the uh, hopefully, uh, I believe it's August. They're talking about August now, August 2020 release of the first issue. Okay. Um, so that's the plan as of today. And it sounds like it's a pretty solid plan. So we're looking at the first issue that releasing in August. Um, and then if, if it goes according to plan, obviously these things are fluid. Uh, it would be bi-monthly after that. So each issue would come out. There'd be a skip month between each issue, but these are double-sized issues. People have asked about that. These are big comics. So you'll have, you'll have plenty of fun for two months, you know, as you read that waiting for the next issue. Um, well, you know, plus the, cause you know, we're, we're sort of nudging our business in between the regular turtles ongoing. So absolutely into that. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of cool turtle stuff uh, as always. And, uh, you know, as we, as we transition back to whatever normal becomes, um, the one thing. Well, see, I, we were always not normal. So this yeah, is, no, yeah. I'm, <laughs> that's true. But the one thing, yeah, the one, I think the one consistent thing we've mentioned it from the beginning of this, this panel is turtles, uh, for 35 years now. And that doesn't seem to be wanting to change. The turtles won't allow it to happen. Trust me. Uh, they, they are still insisting on having stories told about them and we will continue to do so. All right. Listen, thank you again, fans. Um, stay safe. Wash those hands. Um, protect yeah. your loved ones as we all are. We can't wait to be um, spending time with you again in the near future. And so thank you, WandaCon. Thank you, everybody. We're thrilled to be part of this uh, virtual panel. And, uh, you know, Cowabunga. Cowabunga. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>